Thanks so much for uh, just your attentiveness and uh, the encouraging words. It's really been fun uh, to be with you here today. I'm just thrilled by just the collaborative work that you're doing together and how Water Street just continues to bring people together to advance the kingdom. And I'm just excited about where God's going to take this in the future. But in this session, um, I want to uh, leave you with the challenge of not only living out these five blessed practices yourself, but to think about what it would look like for you to move beyond a, uh, beyond only yourself practicing these, but to actually creating a culture of blessing in your churches and ministries. Uh, maybe you've heard this before, but author and culture creator Erwin McManus says that culture is spontaneous, repeated patterns of behavior. Erwin <laughs> McManus. Um, culture is a spontaneous, repeated patterns of behavior. Let's say that together. Okay, ready? Culture is spontaneous, repeated patterns of behavior. And a management guru, Peter Drucker, says culture eats strategy for breakfast. Sometimes people say, wow, we got Peter Drucker on two different lines too. Look at that. All right. Uh, and if we hope to carry out the mission of Jesus and share his love with our friends and neighbors, then we need to create cultures of blessing in those churches. Uh, just before Jesus left the earth to be with the Father and return to, to the Father, he said these words. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now, who did Jesus say would receive power? Us, right, yeah, you, us. Who did Jesus say would be his witnesses? Us, you, us together, right. And so I think we have to ask ourselves, I mean, do we, you know, think this was just a nice pep talk that Jesus gave to his closest followers before he left, or did he really mean it? I mean, was this a pipe dream, or was he really convinced that we would indeed carry out his mission to the entire planet? I mean, I've been told for a long time that I need to believe in Jesus. And I do. <laughs> but more and more I'm beginning to realize that not only do I need to believe in Jesus, I need to believe that Jesus believes in me and he believes in the people that he's entrusted me to lead. Uh, my friend uh, Brian Zare with uh, a group called Intentional Impact taught us that culture includes three elements, values, narrative, and behaviors. Culture includes three elements, values, narrative, and behaviors. Values. Narratives, narratives, which includes the language we use and the stories we tell. All right? Narrative includes the language we use and the stories we tell, and then behaviors. And if we want to love our neighbors and change this entire county, <laughs> we must first value the mission. Yeah, we've got to value the mission, this call of Jesus to, to love others. I mean, that has to be the conviction of our minds. It has to be the passion of our hearts. But I think we all know that talk is cheap, right? Most any Christian anywhere would say, yeah, I, I believe in the Great Commission. I believe in the Great Commandment. Yeah, well, serve, love God, love people, sure. And I think sometimes in our churches, you know, and other organizations, we'll spend hours, even days, determining our values, right? We put them on our website, post them on the wall, but too often they stay there. They stay on the wall, they stay on the website, and they never penetrate our hearts or actually turn into action. I mean, when we truly value something, we hold it dear, we, we sacrifice for it, we believe in it, and we reward those who pursue it. I heard someone say that you can tell what a church values by what they applaud. Think about that. When was the last time your congregation stood up? You got that? Never. <laughs> I think you know what I mean. So in order to create a culture of blessing, we have to reinforce what we say we value with narrative. The language, is, the language we use and the stories that we tell have to articulate the importance of those values. For example, okay, I, you know now, I, I, uh, I love Chicago. I was born and raised in Chicago. I love the sports. I mean, I love the restaurants. I love the people. I love the neighborhoods. I value Chicago. So you can tell that I value Chicago by the way I talk, by my language. My, re my language reflects that value. And so when somebody says they're from Chicago, but they actually live in the suburbs, right, they're what? Lying. <laughs> I've, I've lived in the city now to kind of have that edge, and we know where liars go, right? <laughs> But their behavior, their, their language doesn't reflect what they say they value. We also know that anyone who refers to the tallest building in Chicago as anything but the Sears Tower, as it was called for decades, 
is not really from Chicago. They're a tourist. And finally, anyone who puts ketchup on a hot dog, well, I don't know what to say about that. <laughs> but, you know, my point is that narrative, which includes the language we use and the stories that we tell, matters. It tells you what someone values. And if we're going to bless and share the love of Jesus with more and more people in our communities, we're going to have to develop language and stories that support that value. A quick story. I, uh, a while back, our neighbor, we live in a, a, a large house. There's four units in our house, a uh, couple of three bedrooms, one bedroom, two bedrooms. So we're kind of in this big old house together on the north side of Chicago. And one of our neighbors had surgery on her leg. And so my wife, Lisa, and I, we went to the store. We put together a little, you know, simple care package for her, some snacks, mints, a candle, a magazine. And we dropped it off and left it at their door. And it wasn't a big deal, you know, not hard, not threatening. Uh, but was that loving? I think it was, yeah. Was it a blessing? Sure, I think it was. And, and, and I tell you that quick story, and I tell that story over and over again as just like a, another simple reminder of what it looks like to bless our friends and neighbors. You see, we reinforce our values with the stories we tell and the language that we use. Uh, we further reinforce our values through our behaviors, the actions that we take. And again, we're talking about creating culture, values, things that you hold dear, that you cherish, that you believe in. Narrative, which includes language and stories, right? Have to support those values. And then you've got to have behaviors, ways people can actually live out those values. And I think in order to create a culture of bless, we have to simply begin to engage in these bless practices. We know Jesus' followers have a calling to fulfill Jesus' mission, but I find that few churches or individuals actually have intentional missional practices to live out that calling. And that's one thing that I, I you know, even for me personally, I, I love about the blessed practices is that they're designed to help us live out that mission, to, to fill that gap, right, by equipping people with five everyday ways to love their neighbors and change the world. And, and sadly, in most of our churches, there's this gap between what we say we value and what we actually do. You know, we say we value loving our friends and sharing the gospel, the good news of Jesus, but we haven't given people practical ways to live it out. And so we have to define that gap, all right? This is going to be vitally important. You have to define that gap between what we say we are doing and what we are actually doing. And then my encouragement would be for you to leave here and declare your commitment to blessing others as a way to live out that mission. Uh, the task of a leader really is to define reality. The task of a leader is to define reality. And I think in this case, it's to boldly and clearly state the difference between what is and what could be. And I would encourage you, as we all return to our churches and ministries, we have to define the gap between our calling to fulfill the mission and what we're actually doing to fulfill that mission. And that gap right there is what we hope to overcome, right? And so I think we have to honestly ask ourselves, you know, you know, with God's help, is this who we are determined to, to become? Um, will we be committed to this mission? Uh, are we willing to die on this hill? Um, in his book, Atomic Habits, James Clear reminds us that all big things come from small beginnings. The seed of every habit is a single, tiny decision. Think about that. The seed of every habit, if you want the missional practices of blessed to become how your church and the people in your church live out the mission, that could happen from the single tiny decision you make today to say, yep, that's the way we're going to live out the mission. Um, and I think you can make that decision today with these five practices. And let's not forget, I mean, you know, there are folks around us every single day who are so far from God facing a Christless eternity. You know, people that are desperate for hope, longing for meaning, searching for answers to their questions. And, and I know you're here today. You wouldn't spend, you know, nine hours in a day if you weren't wanting to bless them. We want to bless our friends and neighbors. We want to, even strangers, we want to show them the love of Jesus and, and help them find the grace and hope and peace and forgiveness that can only be found in Jesus. And I can tell you at Community Christian Church, the church where I serve, you know, it was about 10 years ago that we discovered that we had a gap. We had a significant gap. And uh, this equation right here is a little bit more particular to community, but maybe it'll help you understand and give you some ideas for how you can communicate your gap. Because we would have said at community that um, we value people being on mission. We value sharing the love of Jesus with our friends and neighbors. But we also said we value church multiplication. And that was sort of something we, we were kind of 
big on, and we started new locations, started new churches. We were, you know, multiplying uh, small groups and teams and leaders and locations and churches and even networks of churches. We had a passionate and heartfelt conviction about both parts of this equation. But the truth is, in our context, we were much more effective multiplying leaders, groups, teams, campuses, and churches than we were at actually mobilizing individuals to be on mission where they live, learn, work, and play. Am I making sense? And see, I think if we want to experience a real move of God, we have to have multiplying churches, yes, but also people in those churches who are on mission every single day where they live, learn, work, and play. Blessing people. And the mission isn't just for the staff. The mission isn't just for the leaders. We need everybody. And so... You know, we did value multiplication. We would have said we value people being on mission. But I have to tell you, and you know this from the first session, when it came to language and behaviors or stories and actual actions to reinforce those values, we were much further ahead when it came to multiplying churches than we were with missional people. And uh, this is for us where I would say, uh, you know, declaring the blessed practices as the behaviors that would empower our people to be on mission uh, really was a game changer. It was a game changer. And we have a long ways to go, okay? I'm not saying like everybody's doing this every day, day in and out. No, I mean, this is something we have to constantly reinforce with stories, with language, right? And with these behaviors. Um, but the first step for us in creating a culture of bless was to declare it. I mean, to declare that these five ways would be how we would go about living out the mission. Uh, one example, Rudy and Amber are a couple, uh, the stories in the book, who, who like many of us, they didn't know their neighbors, and so they began with prayer, right? Praying for their neighbors, listening to them. And theirs was a very uh, diverse community. They're cul-de-sac, different cultures, different life stages. Some people new to the neighborhood, others who had been there for quite some time. And so they decided that food might be a great way to, to bring this diverse group together. And so every Tuesday, uh, they invited everyone to come over, and they, they pulled their barbecue uh, from, instead of being in the backyard, out to the front yard, in the driveway, and they just started grilling up some burgers and brats. And they would tell you that the first four weeks, I mean, there was either like one family or actually nobody that showed up at all. Easy to get discouraged, right? But Rudy and Amber, they were persistent. They weren't going to give up. They continued to do this week after week. And after a month, there was a breakthrough and pretty soon the whole, like, cul-de-sac, the whole neighborhood was coming over for brats and burgers. It was awesome. And people started sharing, I mean, like, relational struggles, financial challenges, real stuff. And not only that, they started serving each other. So here was Ren, Ru Rudy and Amber serving their neighborhood. Their neighborhood started serving together each other, one another. It was powerful. And they told me that they know it's just going to be a matter of time until they actually help someone find their way back to God and get to know the love and grace of Jesus. But see, I think you and your team and your church will need to declare it. Make the decision together today to bless. I think, you know, the mission of Jesus is far too important. I don't have to tell you that. You know it. Not to have some really clear practices that people can hang their hats on and, and do day in and day out. And, you know, we may have an opportunity like we've not seen in decades. Uh, the Barna Research Group calls Gen Z the open generation. Did you know that? They call Gen Z the open generation. Over half of Gen Zers say they are motivated to learn about Jesus. Over half. That doesn't get in the press, does it? Over half are motivated to learn more about Jesus. So let me just encourage you, declare it, define that gap between where you are and where you want to be, and declare together today with your leadership team to engage in these five everyday ways to love your neighbor and change the world. Start doing it yourself right now so you'll have stories to tell. You'll be comfortable with the language and that way it can permeate your entire church and you can create culture. Um, I just wanted to mention this too. We just released a, um, a resource that could help you and your teams uh, create a culture of blessing in your church. I think we might have the, the link. Do we have the link on the screen there by chance? And it's a nine-week course that we just released that includes instructional videos to equip you and your team, testimonials from practitioners, uh, some strategic planning tools as well. Oh, you can use the QR code, I guess, if you want to take a look at that. Um, but I want to wrap up by coming back to our why. Is it okay if I go two minutes? Um, you know, why is this so, so vital? And I, and I always want to come back to this because I think when we talk about these things, we have to remember this is about, uh, I mean, it's about Rod and uh, Tabitha. It's about Sam and, and Dave. It's about uh, Mitch and Hillary. Those are my neighbors. It's about individual people experiencing the love of Jesus for the very first time, people who are facing a, a Christless eternity, 
people that are looking for hope, people that are looking for purpose, looking for answers to their questions, people that are around us every single day. And it reminds me of, um, of Dana, and I wanted you to hear her story as a way for us to kind of not forget that what we're talking about is one person at a time, one individual experiencing the grace and hope and love of Jesus for the very first time. And if that's what blessed can do. This is Dana's story, and I'm going I'm to end with this. My name is Dana, and I started attending community with my dad, Terry, and my son, Finn, almost four years ago. When I started coming to community, I was, I was probably a daily drinker. You know, I would go to work and, you know, take care of my son, get him from daycare, and, you know, I always had wine in the fridge. I was like my security blanket, and um, I, it's like all day I couldn't wait till I could just have a drink, just have a glass of wine, then I could be okay, you know, because everything was so overwhelming for me all the time. And because I tried, you know, a lot of people who struggle with addiction, they try so hard to, to fix themselves. And I, in the more, it's like a vicious cycle where, okay, I'm not gonna do that again. And then go have a couple days, and then all of a sudden before I know it, I'm, I'm right back where I was. And that pattern just causes such shame and guilt and hopelessness, like it's never gonna get better. And the, the thing I needed more than anything was the very thing that I was completely um, turning down, like I didn't think it would work, which was church and God. And that's when I went to the small group and I walked in uh, Plainfield and there was, it was in the green room behind the stage and there was three people and they were completely different, you know, different ages and stuff. And I walked in and they were all just so nice they didn't think I was crazy. Like, I was saying crazy things like, you know, well, I do this, and, and sometimes, you know, I'm thinking this, and, and they're, they're just like nodding their heads and just nodding, like, mm-hmm, and, but they weren't drinking anymore. Every day, um, I had suggestions to do, you know, in the morning I wake up and I ask God for, the, for help, ask God for the power to not pick up a drink. I would, try to make a meeting of some sort, whether it was my small group or um, a meeting outside of church. And then if I didn't drink at night, tell God thank you. That was another, it was a whole new concept was God, your will be done. That was a completely new concept to me because um, it was just giving up control. I don't know when it happened, it was a few months in maybe, but one day I realized, I don't remember the last time I thought about drinking. I felt like I was joke that I felt like I was like George Bailey in It's a Wonderful Life or you know or Scrooge Ebenezer Scrooge in A Christmas Carol like I was like oh my gosh like and that's when I knew oh my gosh miracles happen because I honestly thought I was going to want to drink for the rest of my life that's the freedom of the Holy Spirit is that I'm able to do things that I never thought I could do on my own whether it's staying sober or um, being a single mom or going back to school um, to be a nurse <laughs> and I'll have a job and and um, forgive people that I thought I could that didn't apologize like you know I, I can do that today that's that's freedom I don't have resentments anymore I don't have secrets anymore the one thing I never treated and I never thought to um, address was my spirit you know my soul and that was the thing that was gone it was dead I you know I didn't know who I was and um, that's that's what I feel like has been restored. It sounds silly, but like I know who I am today.